Thank you so much for that. I um, I only understood one word of that, and you know it was Gandalf. So in the United States, they refer me to uh, they refer to me as the Godfather of Web Analytics, and we thought maybe that wouldn't be such a good idea in Italy. <coughs> Thank you all for being here. I am Jim Stern, uh, founded eMetric Summit, Digital Analytics Association, and wrote a lot of books about all of this back when books were a good idea. Uh, all of these books can now be found in dead tree museums all over the world. Uh, the eMetric Summit started in Santa Barbara in 2002, and the audience, you, created the Digital Analytics Association in 2005. So at the end of the year, we'll be celebrating our 10th year as an association of analysts. And I'm very pleased about that exciting group. As the keynote, my responsibility is to explain the big picture, the broad spectrum. So I want to talk about digital analysts for marketing. What is a great digital analytic analyst for marketing? So I want to cover these three areas. I want to explain all of marketing. That'll take about half an hour. And then I'll explain all of digital. That'll take about 15 minutes. And then all of analysis, which is where I want to spend my time. But we start with marketing. Marketing, as we all know, is about chickens and sheep. And the relationship between chickens and sheep. So I have two chickens. You have a sheep. I will trade you my chickens for your sheep. And you say, no, 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 the sheep is much more valuable than the chickens. Okay, I will make it four chickens. No, 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 I will make it six chickens. Oh, well, now we have a conversation. And conversation is what it's about. Has anybody read the Clue Train Manifesto? Is this familiar? A few hands? Okay, great. This is a book written in the early 1990s explaining that all of corporations have got it all wrong and that the marketplace is a conversation. The value of what I want to sell to you, if I want to sell you this remote clicker, we have a conversation about what it might be worth to you and what it might have cost me and is it a valuable one or not. And then, in the middle of the 1800s, Joseph Wanamaker invented the price tag. He said that if everyone was equal before God, everyone should be equal before price. And he invented the price tag. Before that, it didn't exist. He also had the first copyrighted advertisement. And he also is most famous for having said, half of the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. So that's our job. As analysts, our job is to figure out where to spend the money better. And marketing is basically about making a lot of noise. It's about being loud enough that people can hear when you say, I have something to sell you. Look over here. We have, uh, I have fruits and vegetables. I have seafood. Come and get my, my wares. And if you're loud enough in the street, they can hear you. Well, this is valuable because we have to be heard above all others and we need to build awareness. You have to know that I have something to sell. You have to like what it is that I'm selling. You have to want to buy it, and then hopefully you eventually do. So I'm trying to build trust through advertising. There are so many products to buy that you have to have a way of discerning which one is best. And it's not just trust, it's also desire, because all of these are the same. They're metal boxes with four wheels and a steering wheel. But clearly, these are better than all of the others. And of course, the, the one on the far right is obviously the best of all. We make a lot of noise. We spend a lot of money to make a lot of noise. But the problem is we've made too much noise. So rather than going for just decibels, we have to go for signal. We want to get the message to the right person at the right time. And we need to measure whether that's, not, that's working or not. So we use classic advertising metrics, reach frequency in order to get to awareness. Reach is very straightforward. Reach is about how many people I can get my message to. I want every architect in the world to find out what it is I'm selling. Well, I can't afford that. So every architect in Italy to know what I'm selling. Well, I can't afford that. 
every architect who reads Casabella. Okay, now I, there's something I can buy. I can buy reach that, let's just say, is 12% of all the architects in Italy. Now I know what my reach is. My reach is 12% of the universe. How often uh, do I have to reach these people for the message to stick? Now we talk about frequency. So, if I have three exposures and I spend X euros and I get Y responses, that's a baseline. If I double my spend and spend two times the euros and I get twice the response, this is good. I'm moving in the right direction. I then spend three times the euros but I still only get double the response, I have found out how much to spend on advertising before it's no longer effective. I have optimized my advertising. So we have reach and frequency, and I've created an opportunity to see. I don't know how many people actually saw it, but I know how many people had the opportunity to see, just like putting a billboard on the highway, how many cars drove by. So that's an opportunity. Did they see it? Were they looking at the billboard? Were they playing with the radio? Were they texting? Were they actually watching the traffic? I'll never know. So I'm going to look at awareness from a different perspective. I'm going to have to survey people. I'm going to have to ask people, do they recognize the name? Do they remember what the name stands for? And do they understand what the brand attributes are? This is a luxury automobile. This is a fast automobile. This is an inexpensive automobile. Have I successfully gotten across the message that I'm trying to communicate? Back when I was a child, there were three ways to get your message out there. We had the newspaper, we had radio, and we had three television stations, and that was it. And I had a fourth one that I could use if I was not interested in just awareness, but also response, and that was the direct mail catalog. So Sears, big retailer in the United States, put out a, the Christmas catalog every year. This is now the 1960s. They put a cute little girl on the front of every, ma of every catalog until one year they decided to go really crazy and they put a cute little boy on there as well. And then they started to do something called database marketing. Now this was a new thing. Using location, so your postal code, Demographics, how old you are, how much you earn, what your uh, ed education level was. And psychographics, what magazines do you read, what groups do you belong to, what political party do you belong to. They could determine and segment because we had this thing called computers, database marketing. Essentially, they took the entire audience that they could address and identified one small group and they sent them a catalog. And then another group, they sent them a different catalog. And a third group, and sent them a different catalog. And then they measured the results. And it was very clear to see which of these was the winner that they should then send to everybody else in their database. Very effective way of optimizing direct mail. So I've got reach, frequency, awareness, and response that I can measure. Response for us in the digital world means something different. When we first started, back in 1995, building websites and measuring the results, it was about click-throughs and page views. Click-throughs and page views are a waste of time because that's not what people are interested in. People are interested in finding out about your products, configuring the laptop, the color of the car, comparing to other products, and deciding which one they should purchase. The verbs are what we want to measure. We want to measure what people are doing, what they're trying to do, and were they successful. Oh, and then it all has to happen on mobile systems as well. Our job has become incredibly more difficult as mobile grows like crazy all over the world, and our responsibility is to take this online web experience and put it over onto a phone and expect it to work properly. We have become responsible for search and pay-per-click and display and, 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 oh yes, and then social media. Social media, which has been around forever, has changed a little bit in the digital world. And we have to keep track of all of these things to determine our influence, 
on awareness and effect and response. So we have marketing entering the digital age. Marketing, which is about sheep and chickens, entering a world of digits. The digital part of this is bits and bytes. And I'm gonna start from the very beginning. How many people, and this is an actual question, show of hands, is there anybody here who can tell me where the word bit comes from? Anybody? Yeah, I had to look it up too. It is a binary digit. A binary digit is a bit. A binary digit is a location in computer memory that is either on or off. It's a one or a zero. It's like a light bulb. It's there, but is it on or is it off? Now that is a bit. When you take eight of them and put them together, you get a byte. And if you analyze this byte, off, on, off, off, on, off, on, off, through the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, the ASCII code, you get the letter J. That's it, it's a byte. It's one letter, not very informative. It is a byte. Now, if I take three bytes and put them together, you get the name Jim. Now, what we know is this is a single piece of information. It is a datum. A number of bytes put together created a datum. It is a location, they're on or off, it's encoded through ASCII, and we recognize this as being a first name. But that's not information yet. It is a single datum. If I associate it with another datum, oh, we now have a full name. We now have a full name that allows you to call it data because it's multiple datum, it is data, and it allows you to go to LinkedIn and see, oh, there are five different Jim Stearns. So we know it's a first name and last name, but we still don't know who it is. So I need to, well, I need to, to stop for just a second. Datum is singular, data is plural. Data are good is correct. Data are good is really annoying. So we're going to agree that we're just gonna use it as a singular and say data is good and leave it at that. Now I know that, that it's Latin and I'm in the home of the Latin language and that's just, we're going to agree that we can use data as a plural or a singular just to make life easier. So we have a first name and a last name, but now if I add additional information, my mother's name, my US social security number, now we have actual information in fact, you have enough information that you can go out there and, and steal my identity and open up credit card accounts and bank accounts and buy a house. So that's not my mother's maiden name and that is not my social security number. <clears throat> but this is information. Knowledge that you get about someone or something, facts or details about a subject. In this case, you can clearly identify that subject as me. This is information but we have a couple of more steps to go first. If you found out that I have a couple of the funniest looking dogs on the planet, I drive an electric car, I like to vacation in Palm Springs, I'm addicted to peppermint, I'm almost reached three million miles on United Airlines, I studied Shakespeare, my wife is a judge, we live in Santa Barbara, I wrote a book on social media metrics, and I collect antique Meerschaum pipes, that's more than information. That's knowledge. You know stuff about me. You know who I am now. You, in fact, you know more about me than Google does. Knowledge is information that you collect that you can get out of books. You can go read all of those books and fill your head with knowledge. There's also the knowledge. How many people have taken a taxi ride in London? A few of you? Okay. London cabbies are the best in the world because of the knowledge. Before being licensed as a taxi driver, you have to demonstrate you're able to take passengers to their destination by the shortest possible route. You have to learn the knowledge because London is not a grid, it's not a simple city. It's convoluted, it depends on the time of day, the one-way streets, how many drunks there are in the street, how many out-of-town drivers there are who are driving on the wrong side, right? If you study the knowledge for two years full time, you can pass the test, but most people 
they have real jobs, so it takes longer for them. Let's take an easier example. I live in Santa Barbara. It is a grid. It's easier to get around. And here is a specific datum, 1315 Anacapa Street. Now, it looks like information. It's an address, but actually it is merely a location. Yes, there's a street name and a street number. There's a city, a state, and a postal code, but still it is just a location. It is a datum. To make data, well, we know a, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a place that sells cupcakes. Now we have some data. Information is what time the cupcakes are available. Knowledge, where is a good place to park? Wisdom, don't go there more than once a week. Because if you go there and, and eat their wonderful cupcakes, that are truly spectacular, and you take them home and eat them, you will have to do a great deal of this to avoid looking like all the other Americans. <clears throat> so wisdom is what we're trying to achieve, wisdom and insight. And we arrive at wisdom by taking two different bodies of knowledge and putting them together. In this case, everything you know about crush cakes and everything you know about love handles. Right? Put those together, wisdom comes out. Okay, that was, that was fun, let's do that again. I'm, I'm on a food theme this time, so we're going to go with tomato. That is a datum. It is the name of an object, that's all you know. A picture is worth a thousand words. It's red, it's round, it's ripe, it's ready to eat, it's delicious, that's good information. The tomato is a fruit. Now that stops people because I always think of tomatoes as vegetable, but no, actually botanically, it is scientifically defined as a fruit. The knowledge that you might have is that fruit salad is really delicious and it's easy to make. Wisdom says don't put tomatoes in a fruit salad, not a good idea. But the insight that you gain from that is that you can treat the tomato like a vegetable and have a nice caprese salad. Excellent. So here's another little piece of information. It is a botanical fruit. It is a culinary vegetable. It's also legally a vegetable in the United States. This is known as arcane information. The US Supreme Court justices admitted that tomatoes were technically fruits. But in everyday life, Vegetables were things usually served at dinner in, with, or after the soup, fish, or meats, and not like fruits, generally, for dessert. This was back in 1893. Why would the US Supreme Court care about whether tomatoes are fruits or vegetables? Because Mr. Nix did not want to pay 10% import tax on his tomatoes, claiming they were fruits, and the Supreme Court said, no, pay the man. You owe us the money. Wisdom and insight is what analytics is for. We're looking at all these numbers in order to gain wisdom and insight. Wisdom comes with experience, doesn't it? Malcolm Gladwell will tell us that it comes with 10,000 hours of experience, which is approximately five years of weekly work doing the same thing, whether it's analytics or figuring out how to use PowerPoint or you name it. To be an expert, 10,000 hours. Knowledge is the process of building up facts. Wisdom lies in their simplification. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Wisdom comes with age. Although Oscar Wilde will tell you that sometimes age comes alone. Wisdom is something that you gain over time, but then it stops if you stop learning. There comes a point where true terror is you wake up one morning and discover that your high school class is running the country. Now, there's, there's a few of us with gray hair here in the audience, and you know what I mean. You find out people who are younger than you are running the place. It's very scary because their information stops. They don't understand what's happening in current life. Their wisdom starts to diminish. Information continues, 
But if you don't continue to learn it, eventually wisdom drops off and you become grouchy Smurf. You become that guy who says, get off my lawn. We don't want to be that one. If you created a perfect business plan on January 26, 2010, and you got funding and you started your company, you missed something really important that happened the very next day. And your business plan might not be valid anymore. So you have to continuously learn. It is the continuous accumulation of knowledge, which is good for the brain. The brain loves to learn. Every time you learn something new, the brain goes, oh, that's lovely, thank you. That's different from insight, which is that aha expression. It is not, I learned something, but I came to a conclusion. I discovered something. I, there was a point at which suddenly it all became clear. It was that flash of brilliance. The light bulb went on. The aha moment. But actually, it was years of knowledge that came together to the point where suddenly it made sense. The years of knowledge are required. Filling your head with knowledge is necessary. In the 1860s and 70s, in the United States, we built the railroads. We started Wall Street. The industrial manufacturing revolution got started. If you were born at the wrong time, you didn't get the chance to take advantage of it. But if you're born at just the right time, you could see all the pieces come together and you could take advantage of the industrial revolution. And there were a few guys who really took advantage of it, did very well. In the 1970s and 1980s, it was the information revolution, and there were a couple of guys who saw, who had the insight, and they took advantage of it, and they did very well. 1990s and 2000s, the communication revolution, the internet. There were a few guys who had the insight, saw the possibilities, and they did very well. Today, data analytics. This is your opportunity to put two and two together, have insight, and do very well. Your job is to take the knowledge that you have and figure out a way to analyze it, reduce it down to its basic bits, figure out what the relationship is between those bits, find others in your database that resemble that particular type of person and create a cohort from them. Now that you have a clear segmented cohort, you can compare that to all of the other cohorts that you've created in order to further the business, in order to find out which of these is the most profitable, which of these is the most loyal, and which of these is the most likely to recommend you on social media in order to look at all the others to determine where should I spend my money, which of these cohorts is most likely that if I move in with more advertising or more promotion or more discounts, I can make them more profitable, more loyal, or more likely to recommend on social media. That will make John Wanamaker very happy. You will know which half of your dollar is being wasted and be able to spend your money better. So I'm going to take the information that I'm collecting and I'm going to add to it. This is information that I get on my website. But my website reaches out beyond just the pages. I'm going to use lots of tags and reach out into the ecosystem of data that's being created. This is a map of the National Basketball Association. This is a map of Sears, the catalog company. Here is a map of T-Mobile cellular phone systems. There's their website, their tag management system, the advertising network they're on, the other networks, the other data brokers that they reach out to. So they're not just grabbing information directly from you, they're grabbing information indirectly, and then they're buying information. Data brokers, not as easy in the European Union, very easy in the United States to find people who are buying this kind of information and selling it to others. So I've got the data that I collect directly, the data I collect through services, and the data that I can buy, and I put all those together and create metadata. And I can start to make assumptions and conclusions and build models of who these people are and what they care about. 
This is now big data. So you know you were not going to get through a couple of days without hearing big data. So here we are. Big data is here because we have more than we've ever seen before. We have lots of different kinds of data we've never dealt with before, and there really is so much of it. But here's a secret about big data. The term big data is something that the media has gotten hold of and just made a big deal out of, and nobody knows what it means. I am going to tell you what big data means. This is where it came from. In marketing, we had all the typical data we were used to, demographic, psychographic, even CRM and call center data. But then, in the late 1990s, we went over into online interactive data. And interactive data almost knocked over the screen. Interactive data is voluminous and different variety. It's just so different. We needed a new technology to manage it. So the people at Yahoo created something called MapReduce, a piece of technology. MapReduce takes the problem and maps it out across thousands of processors, in some case tens of thousands of processors, and asks them each to answer one question and send the answer back up to the machine where we could do the analysis, the slicing, the dicing, the comparing, the decision making. That is where big data came from. This technology, the MapReduce technology, which is now open source. Anybody can use it. It's called Hadoop. So when you hear somebody talk about a Hadoop cluster, they're talking about MapReduce. This is where big data got started. Everything else that folks are talking about is supposition and hyperbola. This is what big data is about. So now you know. The hype cycle of big data says that, yes, you start with some great phrase that everybody loves and everybody gets infatuated and then they realize it's really tough and then eventually you get to the plateau of productivity. Well, guess what? The plateau of productivity includes web analytics, social media analytics, predictive analytics, the things that we do for a living. This stuff is practical and useful regardless of how hype-filled it all seems. It's about using these tools to create the aha. It's taking multiple data sets and bringing them together and creating a realization we did not have before. It is the abstract connection that the right brain makes between two disparate ideas. It's taking two things, putting them together, and coming up with something new. So we've covered marketing. It's about sheep and chickens. We've covered digital. It starts with a bit, and it goes through predictive analytics. But the analytics itself, I haven't quite reached yet, and I want to spend some time on that. It involves people. We have our IT department. Okay, let's call him the data scientist. And then we have, well, okay, the advertising guy. And it doesn't matter if it's advertising or marketing. Let's call him the insights consumer. He's on the business side of the house. He doesn't understand the technology. He doesn't want to understand the technology. He doesn't understand the statistics. He doesn't want to understand the statistics. He wants to know what the insights are. Well, Dilbert over here is very busy with the mechanics. Collect, clean, transform, integrate, store, report, managing data, like you would manage raw material. We need to find somebody who can do the more human side, the exciting stuff, the thinking side. We need somebody in the middle who can look at data and interpret what it means. What does it stand for? What might the next step be? And for that, we need the data detective. So here's our data detective. He's going to sit between the IT department and whoever, whichever business unit, and the best one is where the overlap is the, is the most. The more he understands about IT and the more he understands about the business problem to be solved, the better. He can interpret the data and give insights to the business side so the business can make good decisions, data-informed decisions. This is where the magic happens in the middle. This is where the creativity happens because imagination is more important than knowledge. You need the knowledge, but then you have to apply your imagination. Then it gets creative. If you understand the data, and you understand the problem to be solved, you can be a great analyst. 
So, I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining what a great analyst is. And here's the list. First, you have to understand the raw material. So, the raw material being data. You have to understand the tools you're going to use to interpret the data, understand the problem to be solved, how to do analysis and how to communicate the results. So we start with raw material. Do you know where the data comes from? Do you know how trustworthy the data is? So this is something that actually you can build a model that says transactional data, 99% confidence. Data from the call center, 90% yeah, confidence that it's good data. Data from page views and click-throughs, yeah, that's about 85% confidence. Sentiment analysis from social media, hmm, 52% confidence. Put all those together and you understand which of the data you can rely on, and when you make an insight and somebody says, how sure are you, you can say, ooh, 73.25% sure, and then you can cover yourself. To use the data well, you've got to understand the tools. And, and I, so now I'm going to fall into analogies. It's my best way to move. This is the raw material we're accustomed to. This is the result we'd like to achieve. This is the inspiration for the work we're going to do. And this is the raw material we actually have to work with. And the tools that we brought to deal with this are insufficient. It's not going to help us. We have to bring in the big tools and do it differently, okay? So I'm going to take all of these touch points and each touch point with my customer will have a different way to collect, store, and analyze the data, which becomes very difficult. It's, you know the phrase, trying to compare apples to oranges. Well, here we've got a whole variety because it's all being captured differently, stored differently, and analyzed differently. Our job is ETL, extract, transform, load. Extract from the databases that are collecting, transform it into something that allows us to compare and contrast things together and load it into some common data set that we can actually deal with and, and correlate together. And that's gonna live in a data warehouse that's gonna live somewhere up in the cloud that we can access from anywhere. That's that's the vision, okay? It's a lot of tools that we're all responsible for. Or we're responsible for managing the people who will run the tools. Or we're responsible for outsourcing the management of these tools. But as an analyst, we have to understand how they work so again, we know how reliable and trustworthy they are. Because they're all going to kick out marvelous reports, which are pretty worthless, except that they're pretty unless we understand the problem we're trying to solve. The numbers are the numbers are the numbers, but why are you collecting them? So the first thing is, is the three rules of business. This is, these are the only three things you care about. Make more, spend less, make my customers happy. That's it. Everything else is in service to these three. So I'm gonna have goals, I need them to be very clearly defined. We want to make more money. No, that's not good enough. We want to make 10% more profit within the next six months. Ah, okay, now I have a goal, clearly defined. It is specific. And it has to be politically supported because if the people upstairs don't think it's a good idea, they will not provide the funding to make it happen. And if the people who are doing the work in the factory floor don't think it's a good idea, they won't do a good job of making it happen. So everybody has to agree. And then we get to the analysis part. This is your job. This is what you do for a living. The art of marketing analysis starts with anomalies, things that are odd, because the most exciting phrase is not Eureka, but that's funny. Why is there an outlier? Everything else looks fine, and then there's this one little outlier there. What is going on with that? I wonder. That's funny. So whether it's an outlier, 
or it's a big spike suddenly that happens, or conversely, a big drop. What's going on there? Let's explore that further. Next is segmentation. Because as we all know, everybody is the same. Oh, but everybody is different. Oh, but we can sort of figure it out. So in this room, I've got four columns of people. Okay, that's great segmentation for geography, but all that tells me is that these people like to sit on one side and those people like to sit on the other. Uh, some people are dressed in blue, some people are dressed in white. I can segment, does that help me? Some are male, some are female. Some sit in the front, some in the back. Some came early, some came late. It almost doesn't matter, almost, almost doesn't matter how you segment people as long as it gives you a way to treat them differently. People who came early get a different email. People who came dressed in a coat get a different email. When you start segmenting and finding similarities, then you can test how they are different and get a lot of value, a lot of, of economic lift from that. There are many traps for statistics. The human brain is out to get you, so be careful of these traps. Do not use statistics as a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. And this is probably our most common problem. As an analyst, people come to me all the time and say, I need a report that shows that this advertising campaign was successful. Well, let me look at the numbers and tell you whether it was successful or not first. No, 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 I need to show that I'm going to be able to hire more people. Yeah, that's not how this works. We have to find out reality first. Cognitive biases. This is a page from Wikipedia. Cognitive biases are ways that your mind is fooling you. It's a big, long subject you can tell because the scroll bar is so long. I'm going to just encourage you to go look up cognitive bias and find out the 15 different ways your head is messing with you, including this one. Pattern recognition. The human mind is designed to find patterns even in randomness. So whether you find the face of Jesus Christ on a potato chip, non-bread, banana, or a potato, or the most common method we have, the grilled cheese sandwich, your brain is fooling you to such a degree that this is now available commercially. This is grilled cheeses, only $39.95. How many would you like to put in your brain? And here's the next one. This one is constantly a problem. Correlation and causation are not the same thing. So, some examples. Every time I wake up wearing my shoes, I have a horrible headache. Clearly, wearing shoes to bed causes headaches. And that's not quite true. The beer, the wine, the cognac, the limoncello, thank you very much, uh, cause the shoes and the headache. Ice cream causes drowning. Now, we know that wherever ice cream sales go up, drowning goes up. Ice cream is killing your children. Well, no, actually, when the temperature goes up, sales of ice cream and, and swimming go up. Okay, they're not, they are correlated, but they're not causative. Here's a true statistic. 70-year-old smokers live longer than 70-year-old non-smokers. This is true. And the reason is probably because the cigarettes haven't killed them yet. If you're a smoker and you're still alive at 70, you're much healthier than everybody else on the planet, you will live longer. You should not run out and buy cigarettes this afternoon, please. And then I found this wonderful website, uh, tylerweigen.com, who has built a machine that goes through public information and finds correlations. So, U.S. spending on science, space, and technology correlates with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. There they are. You can see the charts. They correlate exactly. Per capita consumption of cheese in the United States correlates with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. And probably the scariest one of all, number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool correlates with the number of films Nicolas Cage appears in. Do not go to a Nicolas Cage movie. I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't know. Sounds like the class helped. Maybe. Number four, the art, the artistic side. 
the visualization side. This comes to be, this comes in very handy when you're trying to explain the numbers to other people in the organization because we consume so much information through our eyes and so little, you know, just from a bandwidth perspective and so little through the others. So make use of the ability to make charts and graphs, don't go crazy with it, but it's very useful and very helpful when you're trying to communicate. This is, and I've, and I've put the URL in the presentation so you can look it up later, periodic table of visualization methods, when to use what kind of chart and graph for what purpose, and each one is a rollover pop-up that's very useful. I recommend it highly. So I'm a fan of analogies. This is data, individual bits of information. Each one is a different color and shape and size, has a different history, is fascinating. Our job is to understand those little bits well enough to be able to analyze them in the face of this quantity of them. We are required, we are being asked to figure out which way is the dune moving, what do the different ripples mean, do we see any footprints, and it's an overwhelming task. So, what do we do? How do we solve this problem? We build models. We build a model that represents the real world. And these models can be very complex and very big, but we have to remember, and this is a wonderful phrase by George Box, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. They are models. They don't represent reality. They, they are not reality. They only represent reality. So you build a model, and if it's useful, keep using it, but only for so long because they have a time value. The assumptions that you made, the numbers you put in, eventually fade away. Whether it's seasonality or competition or the weather, things change. So if you find a good model, use it, but make sure you're tracking for when it's no longer a good model. Reporting is the stripping away of data for the purposes of communicating. Analysis is the aggregation of data for purposes of pondering, filtering, sorting, ranking, comparing, grouping coming up with insights. If all you do all day long as an analyst is create reports that you email out, you're not being a good analyst. A great analyst is the one who comes up with insights. The great analyst is the one who has the best questions and can figure out what's the next question to ask. The problem is you are responsible for a great deal of information. You have to understand the technology, the math, and the business. And that means you need a lot of knowledge. You have to be able to communicate between the IT people and the business people and the creative people and the statistics folks. You have to be a problem solver. And that right up here, intelligence, okay? So knowledge, fill your head with knowledge and be intellectually capable of understanding it. But then finally, you have to be a lateral thinker. You have to be a dreamer in order to have all of that knowledge create an aha moment. So, for knowledge, read books, read blogs, come to conferences. Thank you very much. For intelligence, practice. Uh, do crossword puzzles, Sudoku puzzles. Keep the brain active. For intuition, yes, take a break, take a walk, take a drink. Well, that's true. Uh, this is Science News, vodka delivers shot of creativity. Alcohol makes people more creative. How getting tipsy may inspire creativity. You can find creativity in a bottle and alcohol benefits the creative process. And here's why. Alcohol lowers your in inhibitions, right? When your inhibitions get low, you do things you wouldn't normally do. When you are full of thoughts and you think in a rigorous manner, you think in a linear path. But when you take a couple of drinks, you can relax, look out the window, and then things occur to you that, that strict thinking and formal method doesn't help with. Drinking actually helps. These tools, they only carry you so far. This is the tool you need to work on. This is your responsibility. Don't fall into any of the traps. Don't cheat yourself by not learning enough. Exercise your brain. And remember that as one grows older, 
One sees the impossibility of imposing your will on the chaos with brute force. But if you are patient, there may come that moment when, while eating an apple, the solution may present itself politely and say, here I am. So take a break, take a walk, eat an apple, have an apple teeny. These things will help you put all the pieces together. You'll put one and one together to get two. All of your knowledge, all of your insight, all of your technical capability is worthless unless you're able to communicate your insights to others. So this is, again, an area of responsibility for you because if the tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, it doesn't make a noise. So how do you communicate well? Well, we can collect data. We can measure things and turn them into metrics. We can crank out reports. We can create benchmarks to compare one to the other. We can set up alerts to warn us about peaks and troughs. We can automate the email that goes out if you visit the website and you put things in the shopping cart and then take them out. We can send you an email or we can follow you around with advertising. But it's insights at the bottom. That's where the money is. That's where the analyst is valuable. So here are the things to do to be good at communicating to others. Number one, tell stories. So let me tell you a story. Did you hear what your brain just did? <laughs> I've been speaking along and showing you slides and you've been going, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I like that. Oh, I disagree with that. Oh, that's interesting. Dot, dot, dot. And then suddenly I say, I'm going to tell you a story and you go, oh, I can stop. I can relax. There will be a protagonist, a goal, an obstacle, a solution, and a moral to the story. And I will have learned something because that's how the human mind works. If you tell me that traffic to my website is up by 23%, conversion is down by 10%, and my profitability has fallen by 7%, uh, I have to make a story out of that. So what am I going to do? What does that mean? Where did that come from? But if instead you tell me the story, I can see the conclusion and I can take action. So figure out a way to turn your numbers into stories but don't tell me how you do it. <laughs> this is a primary, imagine that you are a doctor and you see all the test results, you've got all the numbers, the patient does not want to see the numbers. I can't remember which is my good cholesterol and which is my bad cholesterol. I just need to know, uh, can I, if I just stop eating chocolate, is that okay? Or do I need to take this pill or do I have to have this surgery? Don't tell me the numbers, tell me the results, because if you start talking to people about what you do for a living, it, their eyes will glaze over. It, it all sounds like something mystical and you will make them feel stupid. And I don't like feeling stupid. I want you to include me. I discovered something. Let me explain what I think it's about. Communicate it and tie it to the bottom line. Explain to me how these numbers will impact making more, spending less, and making my customers happy. And for bonus points, tie it to directly to what I am trying to accomplish as an individual. Some people want nothing more than to hire more people and grow their department. Others want to be the employee of the month and have the best parking space. Some just want to do their job and be left alone. And if you can show them how your numbers will help them do their job and be left alone, they'll love you and they'll want your numbers. So tie it to the bottom line, but also figure out what individuals are looking for and help them achieve their goals. So tell stories. Don't go into too much detail. Tie it to the bottom line of making the company a better place. Help individuals achieve their goals, but the most important one there is to have an opinion. Have an opinion about the numbers. Otherwise, okay, I'm good for IT. How about spreadsheets? Anybody here good for spreadsheets? You become an itinerant Excel worker. Be specific. I think we can improve sales by 5% next week if we invest 200 euros 
And I think we can do it, and, and I think we can run this test to find out if I'm right. That's brilliant. Somebody comes to me with that, and I'm just happy. Yeah, run the test. Let's see. That would be terrific. I think we have a problem. I think not enough people are downloading our white papers. And I think it's caused by people not are being able to find them on our website. And I think we might be able to fix it by putting a link to the white papers on the home page. And I can do that in about two hours, and it'll only cost about 50 euros. Oh, by the way, let's do a 10% test. 10% of the people who come to the website will see it, and we can test it against those who don't. Specific. I have an opinion, and I have the numbers to back it up. Okay. <clears throat> what did we learn? Number one, marketing is a conversation about chickens and sheep. Number two, segmentation will serve you well no matter what you do. Big data is simply more data than you're accustomed to. You have to identify the problem to be solved, otherwise the numbers are a complete waste of time. Analytics have no value at all unless you have specific goals. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. You have to master the art of communication to get your point across. And above all, your opinion is your contribution. Your informed opinion that is backed by the data is what's going to make you a great digital analyst and they lived happily ever after. Thank you very much.